Hello everyone, my name is Etienne Enang. So um, today I have with me, I uh, have the pleasure of having with me Professor Paula Dzokoski. Thank you so much for being here with me today, Paula. Thanks for having me. Okay, so in the previous interview, Rebecca talked about the innovative work that you and your team had um, conducted. And personally, I followed your work over the years. And one of the things that has fascinated me is that you've always found innovative ways to present your work in such a manner as to make the most of ethnographic data. And obviously you speak about this in the strategic organization piece. So I'm wondering if you can briefly tell us about the events that led to your collaboration in putting together such a fantastic piece. Uh, yeah, well, it was uh, a bit of a no-brainer for me to do that with Rebecca and Jane because I'd been working with both of them on different projects where we'd been deeply immersed, very ethnographic. Uh, I think Rebecca spoke a little bit about the ethnography we did um, last time. And so we'd had a lot of this very uh, immersed experience at, right down to, uh, for a while, Jane and I were sharing an office and we'd actually be sort of sitting writing up our separate notes and laughing with each other about things that had happened in the field. And um, so we had had that experience of really knowing what was important here, but also the problems of trying to render that when we wrote the papers in such a way that it would be convincing for the reader, that they could somehow feel that the sorts of excitement or why we knew, if you like, that that was the right sort of answer in our um, data, how could they know that? How could they be there enough with us when they read the paper to feel convinced by our evidence? Um, and, and in that, we wanted to go beyond just sort of, you know, like when you use interviews, you sort of extract the quotes that are, uh, you know, maybe best said or something or most easy for the reader to read. Whereas when you've been in the field, it's not very easy to take a field note and say, see from this field note, you can see what it felt like. Because mm -hmm. uh, a field note is, uh, as we try to show in that paper, a very abstracted thing that doesn't actually reflect the experience that you were having. So because we'd done a lot of work on that, it was great to get together and work with them on trying to sort of show that process of, uh, you know, what we call text work. And I think Van Manen very rightly called it, you know, it's not just that we do the field work and that we do the sort of head work of analysing it, but then the only way people can believe our texts, if you like, and I mean, belief is a big part of ethnography, is if our text work is good and brings you there. So that, that was what was behind the collaboration, our own experiences of trying to take doing the work and then turning it into something where someone reading that could see it as a slice of life, if you like. Awesome. So that brings me to my next question. For you, what is the key message of this paper? Um, the key message of this paper for me is actually about the quality of ethnograph ethnographic research. You know, in ethnography, the researcher is the instrument. Their interpretive subjective experiences in the field, yes, triangulated, yes, go through an analytic process, yes, justified in a naturalistic way. But ultimately, if we accept that you are the instrument, then the way that you pre you have to present findings that are real, as in display, what you experienced and why you interpreted this way. So my key thing really is good text work is convincing because it takes the reader there. They could imagine it, they could believe it, they could imagine that experience that you are, that you are conveying through the text work. So it's about quality and qualitative research. Mm -hmm. So speaking about the quality and conveying the message, and I'm going to quote from the, from the paper because you, you said something really, really key. It kind of like struck, struck me. So you talked about the importance of giving the reader a sense of personalized sensory experience gained from extended immersion, um, immersion in the field. To you, why is this so important? So let me explain it with um, sort of some of the work that we actually did. So, for example, in the work that Rebecca talked about last week, we sat alongside these traders, these underwriting traders, as they were placing deals. And uh, sometimes that's quite emotional. There are many uh, millions and billions of dollars being bet here, and uh, they may lose or win a deal, or it might not come out the way they wanted, 
or they'll be trying to, uh, and, and of course, what we're trying to show is the way that it, something that you call a market does trading. And of course, you can't assume that a market does trading just on some sort of efficient things of, oh, my capital costs me this, and that would be the right price for my capital, because then a machine would do it. Uh, this is actually emotional. It's about negotiation. It's about the way that people uh, relationally interact. And so if we're trying to show that, then when you sit beside somebody, they'll have anger, they'll have emotion, they'll be reframing, they'll be looking at the figures and working on the side. And so you've experienced that and you want to render that this is what a market is. A market is not just some price that you see something close at. The very fact that it closes at that price is because of all this work of the market that makes the price. And so um, I, I think the things that we realized is when you want to say, for example, you want to show that, then you need to say so-and-so was angry, for example, or so-and-so was elated. Now, if I just say to you, John was pleased, or you know, Sam was elated, or uh, Sue was furious, well, that, yes, okay, you can believe me on that. But if I say, Stan leapt in the air and high-fived his colleague, you, got, you, you, you understand more than you did if I said Stan was pleased or Stan was elated. I actually show you Stan's elation and I sat there and I felt Stan's elation. I mean, you can't sit beside someone who's just who's leapt to his feet and high-fived his colleague without feeling that emotion. So that's what we try to show going on. And similarly, you know, I'd had in the past things like people would say, well, but how did you know that they were angry about that? And I mean, you know, I, I, I sometimes want to say to people, well, do you know when your um, partner is angry? You know, because that's how I knew that the person I was sitting beside was angry. Uh, you know, the, but I, I learned that I need to say, raising his voice, and I'm sorry, I'm saying a lot of his, but it was a very masculine market. Raising his voice, he yelled down the phone. Um, you know, or going red in the face, he yelled down the phone. Then you will actually, you, now you know how I knew that he was angry. Yeah, so that, that, that became a big part of it, showing people so that they could feel what I was feeling. Mm. That's, that's really interesting. So how important or how central would you say writing was to your research and analytical process? Writing is absolutely essential. To me, writing is a part of the analytic process. Uh, and that's why I sort of, the head work of analysis and the text work of presenting that analysis, they blend into each other. Of course, you do lots of coding and things in the background. But at the start, uh, we write very extended stories, case stories, really, you know, rich, and they can take you in lots of different directions while you try to understand what, what was important to me here. Because what you start to write is where you begin to find out what is important. If I said, and I, this is an exercise I do with people, I ask them to write the story, uh, doctoral students and things, of their morning from when they got up to when they got to the class with me or whatever. And just to sort of see what different stories they write, because when you start to write the story, you begin to start to construct your own analytic framework towards it. What did that day mean to you? And uh, in that sense, so we start writing stories in the field. That's very good because if you're working with others, you swap those stories. You start to understand what the other person's seeing, feeling, experiencing as important and you can bring them together. And then, of course, those case stories, you've got to then go back and do all that analytic unpacking to say, you know, why do I think that? Is it, is it, a, is it a good representation? Is it a valid representation in that sense? Um, and then, of course, you're reconstructing the stories after that, once you've checked the validity of them. And, and uh, to give some sort of idea, we'll often write stories uh, like the empirical findings of a paper at least 13 times before submission. And then in the R&Rs again, I mean, I might only be bits of it, but you think, does it look better here? Can you feel it better here? Then I'll send it out to somebody. I want to see, can they see what points I'm trying to make through reading this? What don't they understand? Just send it back saying, I don't understand this, or why are you claiming that? So that I can go back and think, why is it obvious to me and not obvious to them? You know, so in that sense, writing is is everything. Uh, you know, it's it's how I how I find what it is that I'm thinking, and also then how I try to convey to you what what I experienced and why I why I know this is important. These amazing insights that you've come that are found in majority of your papers. I wonder how far back it's traced to. 
So is it, is, is, are these, are these trends that came out from your doctoral studies or later on in your, in your career, or when did they actually start? You know, it's really interesting and you make me laugh uh, because when I was doing my thesis, um, you know, I had come up with what I thought the findings were and I, I had 20 slides and I went into my supervisor and I was showing him and explaining to him and all of that. And at the end of this hour of me basically talking nonstop, he said, Paula, this is a novel, not a thesis. And uh, oh, that's pretty destructive. But actually, I, I, I like to laugh about it now because on the one hand, it was destructive. But his point was actually very valuable to me because he wasn't saying, I don't believe you. He was saying, this is a novel, so it's interesting. And think about what the word novel means. It is novel. It is interesting. It's a great story, but it's not science. And what does that mean? Okay, so I... And he'd say, for example, you're trying to tell me from the story that you're telling me that structure doesn't matter. But, you know, so does that mean that you are taking on the strategy and structure? You know, are you going to say Chandler was wrong? And I realized, okay, my story is right. I still believe in my story. And actually, he's finding my story novel. But what he's not finding is that I've gone back and shown why this story is novel and important. And that was good learning for me because I could have thrown everything out there. I could have gone back and thought, okay, I need to come from Chandler and I need to say, you know, structure says this and structure says that and here is my two incremental pieces. Or I need to say, now I need to go back and find out why this novel is novel compared to what Chandler was saying. And actually, in some ways, you will see that in the latest paper with Julia Balligan and Jane Lee, where we look at the co-evolution of strategy and structure. We do actually go back to Chandler and things. Um, and, but what we're really trying to do is show these stories of the co-enactment of strategy and structure together. And we, so we show these really rich vignettes that bring out what is novel about the relationship between strategy and structure that wasn't captured in these earlier pieces. So in that sense, where did it come from? It came from the fact that I was doing rich data collection. I, I intuitively knew this is what I wanted to say my thesis was about, but I had no way to do anything but tell the story. Now I know that the story isn't the wrong thing, but the story must be connected to the theory and, and how to, to use the story to interpolate the theory in ways that are more convincing and to show the novelty to the theory. Um, so I'm really grateful to my supervisor for something that I now laugh about, although I have to say, I went away and I climbed the walls for about four weeks trying to work out how to make this novel interesting for a, for a theorist. Lovely. So now that I've looked at the history and I have some insights into the history and you've really progressed, you've, you've come a long way from that PhD student to where you are now. And so I'm wondering if you can give us some insights as to what you'd like to see. And I'm talking now in your capacity as editor, associate editor and all of these um, roles that you fill. What would you like to see in future written pieces in terms of persuasiveness? What is it that you look for when you look at manuscripts? Yeah. So I think one of the things that was very innovative that uh, was starting to develop the composite narrative, um, which we did in our paper on Lloyds of London, where we took out and did a day in the life of Tim. And uh, I've used that in a couple of different places, this kind of day in the life or a slice in the life of somebody, because they're very persuasive. And I mean, there it was quite novel and we had to do quite a bit of work what was interesting to me is all the reviewers liked the story of the day in the life, but all of them also wanted to know, was this science, you know? So we did loads of, or even, wow, aren't you lucky that you had one person who did that? And you had to say, no, no, that's a composite narrative. That's what everyday life is like. That is the narrative of everyday life, uh, you know, and to sort of show them why, because they all liked it and they all found it really interesting, but they didn't know how to understand it as, is it scientific? You know, and so, of course, we've got these extended tables and things and all of that. So we do all the things that will be assuring about representativeness. But honestly, for me as an editor, for me as an author, the, the conviction, the quality of the science is in the fact that you loved the story. You love the story of Tim or in our latest paper on strategy and structure, you know, um, that you really believe in these engineers who are trying to get into these houses and they literally get a foot in the door, you know, you, you can imagine that. You've had an engineer come to your house. Uh, you know, we want you to see that and feel that and understand that is why you believe this. 
yes, okay, if you need the tables because it's some sort of added con conviction for you, we can do that. But you're not believing it because they have 15 tables. You're believing it because you believe in the engineer's foot in the door. And that, for me, is what I want to encourage. As an editor, I'm allowed to be courageous and say, yes, this is good science. How can we help you to convince people that it's good science? But I, I believe your story, therefore it's good science. So in that sense, that's what I'm keen on. That's what I'm keen on as a reviewer. Um, I think we do have more editors who can understand and want to reach for the novelty. And I have to say one of the best things that happened for Jane and I in a different piece on um, paradox and humour, uh, it's called You Must Be Joking, is that we had four reviewers that were very dispersed in their first views of the paper, but they were all so reasonable. And we took it on board and we came back showing these incidences of humour and stuff. And all of them were just like, oh yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, I see you didn't do quite what I want, but I believe you. And that paper has no tables. And yet we turned around four reviewers from very different views. And what I think is they were good reviewers and a good editor, because instead of going, yeah, but I have a prescription in my head of what science looks like, so do the prescription. Uh, you know, they weren't looking for a template. They were saying, oh yes, that's believable. I see why you do that. That's good. And so that is for me where, where this science needs to be going because we aren't doing a quantitative or a positivistic science here. We are doing an interpretive science. So we have to trust interpretation as good science. That's, that's amazing. Thank you so much for those interesting insights, Paula. So for all of you that have been listening, I'm sure that you're having as much fun as I'm having. In the next blog, I'm going to be speaking with Jane Lee about the practice of innovating research methods. So you don't want to miss that. Just stay tuned to that one. Thank you.